But this morning, I'm kind of hoping to share a message that I hope will kind of immunize you against life. Because how many of you know life can really hurt? It can mess us up. It can mess us around. And even sometimes in our relationship with the Lord, we can get stuck in our Christian walk because stuff that happens that we don't always understand, don't always comprehend. And so the title of what I want to preach about this morning is called God's Ways versus God's Actions. And uh, I want to explain what that is about, how that works, and hopefully give you kind of a, a vaccine so that you can move forward through life without getting sidelined, shipwrecked, and stuck. Because getting stuck is terrible, especially when it comes to issues of the soul and the heart. So we're we going to start in the scriptures, Psalm 100, and, this is when you get old, eh? Psalm 103, verse 7, I think it is. Is that right? Yeah. I should have made my printing bigger. You know, you're getting old and in the morning, looking at yourself, I'm like, I'm starting to do that to my notes. So here we, we're reading about Moses, and it says, God made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. So there is a difference between ways and acts. Ways is very different from acts, and that acts is what I just did. In other words, if you're going to know God through his acts, you're going to look at what just happened in your life, and you're going to try and understand God through that lens. And let me just tell you, if that's the way you're going to try and live your life, you're going to get stuck very, very quickly. Instead of reading God through acts, things that happen, we have to understand God's ways. And his ways are higher than sometimes it seems his acts are. Uh, so the difference really is this. Moses knew how the big picture. He kind of knew where God was going and, and ultimately how these things would fit into the big picture. Israel read God based upon what happened. So kind of this happened and they were like, Woo-hoo-hoo! then something bad happened and they were all very down. And if I'm honest, most of us as Christians, we struggle with this because we read God through acts. We read God through our emotions. We read God through stuff that happens to us. And uh, so many people, uh, you you know, even when you're trying to witness to people, often you try and tell them about Jesus and they don't understand his ways. So the classic line is, well, you know, I don't believe in God because how could there be a God if there's so much evil in the world? Right there you realize they don't know God's ways. They don't know the mysteries of how God works. And they've got stuck in the acts, things that have happened that have kind of uh, short-circuited them. So... um, one of the classic stories about someone who got it wrong, and Jesus tried to help through this, because I want just we need to realize that Jesus doesn't want us to get stuck. I, I, I meet Christians all over the world, and so often many have got stuck at a certain place in their spiritual walk. It's like we, we develop and develop and develop, and then something happens, and we just get wrecked there. We get shipwrecked in that moment, and we can't seem to move forward into the more of God. And uh, this is quite a common problem with us humans. Because of the sin of Adam, we'll look at just now. It's something that all of us will battle with. And one of the guys that really did get stuck with Jesus was called the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. And that was John the Baptist. It's quite interesting that a prophet could get stuck when it came to Jesus. And the place that he got stuck was actually, we read it in Matthew 11, verse 2 to 6. We'll put it on the board and just read it quickly. And I'll give you the background. Now John, this is John the Baptist, heard in prison, and let me just tell you, when you're in prison for Jesus, it's quite easy to get stuck. All right. About the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. How did John miss that? Do you remember just, it wasn't long before this, that John is baptizing people in the River Jordan. And um, Jesus appears and he sees the Spirit of God come on Jesus. And he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Heaven opens in that moment. The Holy Spirit comes down like a dove on Jesus And he knows this is the Messiah. This is the one. And he starts saying, like, I'm not worthy of untying his sandals. This is the one God's spoken about. This is why I was raised up. My whole life's purpose is to point you to him. And a little bit later, the guy that got all that revelation, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, is going, "Uh, did I get it right? Because you're nothing like I thought you'd be. I'm sitting in prison. I didn't expect that. And, uh, Oh, you're the one. How did he get there? How did he get so stuck that he missed? I mean, how do you get better than that? 
And yet John the Baptist got stuck. And Jesus shows us the reason. He says, because he got offended. There was an offense that John took. And the reason for it, if you look at the history and what John was doing, John was a prophet, and he was a fiery prophet. I mean, he was one of those guys you'd be a little bit scared of. You know, guys would come to him, and he were like, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? He was this down-the-line kind of turn burn prophet. And when he, he would read the scriptures and read about the Messiah that would come, who he was supposed to get Israel ready for, and to him, Jesus was going to come and deal with sin in Israel. Israel was losing warm, compromised. The king of Israel, Herod, is literally, I mean, he's the Jewish king. In other words, he's the elder. In the modern equivalent, he'd be Jonathan in your circles. And he's just divorced his wife and married his brother's wife. And there's just sexual immorality. And it's like, so John, as a prophet, rebukes the king, thinking, you're going to get sorted out so badly because I know who's coming. The real king is going to come sort you out. And the next thing is in jail. He's about to lose his head. Everyone's left him. His disciples have gone. Got a few left over. And he's just like, this is not how I thought it was going to work out. This is totally different to what I expected. And so he begins to doubt Jesus. Are you actually the one? Or have I missed the whole point of this thing? Now, and Jesus says, blessed is a man who is not offended. And he uses a brilliant Greek word. It's scandalon. It's an interesting word. It's actually uh, a scandal on is actually a part of a trap. If you had to uh, put a mouse trap out, you would have a part that is set with cheese. Do you still use mouse traps? <laughs> In the olden days, they used to use these things. <laughs> you would have a uh, you would have a um, cheese on a little tra trap door, basically. And the point was that the, 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 the rat would get attracted to the cheese. And as he'd been nibbling the cheese, he's actually on the scandal on. He's working the pot that'll set the trap. And at one point, he, he sets the trap, the scandal on. Bang, the thing comes down, and you don't have a rat problem anymore. And Jesus says, blessed is a man who doesn't get trapped because I'm different to what he expects. Blessed is a man who, when I don't move the way he expects him, me to move, doesn't get stuck in that moment. That's really what he's saying. And the word scandal is beautiful because really Jesus cannot have impure motives. Jesus cannot ever try to hurt you. Jesus' heart is to redeem you. He may hurt you, but his heart is not to hurt you. His heart is to redeem you and restore you and give you life. So John gets trapped. And Jesus says, don't get stuck, John. Don't get stuck because I'm different to what you thought. You see, John thought Jesus was going to be a political ruler. Let's be honest. Don't we all want political salvation right now? You guys are in political turmoil like we are in our country. Everyone's crying out, and injustice, and media's going bananas. Let me tell you, our hope is not in this world. And Jesus came to set that straight because even in Israel, John expected a political ruler. And Jesus said, my kingdom. Is not in this world. It's not of this world. And John got stuck with that. How can you come to your own people and be so different? Why don't you sort us out? Jesus doesn't fit our paradigms. He doesn't fit our world. And uh, I, I bet you when John was sitting in jail, just thinking, what on earth happened? This is not how I thought it was going to be. So, scandal on. The trigger of a trap. You know, a lot of us, we, we really are like John, because how many of you know we have illusions about God? We have illusions about life. You know what? Disillusionment simply means you had an illusion at the start, and then a dis came in because it didn't work out like you thought it was going to work out. And can I say, life is going to throw a lot of disillusions our way, because God isn't like us. His ways are infinitely higher than ours. And we want to understand, we want to get God down, we want to you know, have the little jukebox or the little ticky box, or whatever the things is. You stick something in and something comes out. I mean, even in our prayers, you look at a lot of the guys that are processing faith and how does it work and miracles. And if I do that, God will do this. And he said, hey, God does what God does. He does what he does. And uh, we can't make him do what we want him to do. He is God and he does what he does. I'll never forget getting trapped in my own life. There's been a few times that I really, I, I got stuck. And one of them, it wasn't long, but it, it was a terrible moment. I'll tell you the story. We, as a young man, I had, um, I had a deep passion to serve Jesus from the day I got saved. I wanted to give him my whole life. And uh, 
from the day I was saved, I led my first person to the Lord Jesus the day I got saved. About a week later, I spoke in a school, and I led about 20 people to Jesus. And it was just, it was like everywhere I went, people were getting saved. And it was very exciting, and I, I loved it. I loved telling people about Jesus. I loved, I, I'd been a recluse my whole life, but when I was born again, everything changed. And suddenly, it was like, I'd, and I longed to serve God in ministry. I was coming through the life of a church, and the Lord led us out of that. I was about to get given a church, and we joined up with a church in Port Elizabeth. And I had to get, go back to get secular work, which which. Uh, which sucked. I, I wanted to serve Jesus. I didn't want to work in the marketplace. I was like, I want to be a Levite for you, God. I want to give my life to you. And now you're sending me back into the marketplace. For seven years, I had to go back into the marketplace. At the end of those seven years, I came through finally into ministry. And I was so excited to be in ministry. I was an elder in the church. I was serving alongside another guy. I was leading, young man in the Lord, and just passionate about you know, the king and the kingdom. And then finally, after years of serving in that local church, the apostolic team we were in relationship with at that time came to me and sat me down and said, we believe it's your time. Like, you have served so faithfully in the house of God. We want to send you to plant a church somewhere. We'll endorse you, we'll back you, but we believe this is God's moment for you. And I have to say, this was probably one of the most glorious moments of my life up until that point because I had served so long and so hard in other men's homes and it was like God was saying, you've served faithfully in another man's house, now I'm gonna give you your own house to lead. And I was very, very excited. Ems and I were thrilled, my wife, we were just absolutely thrilled with what was happening. We had prophetic words that started coming about a new season, a new thing. God was going to do a wondrous thing through our lives, and we were very excited. Just before we left to plant our church in Cape Town, which happened now about 18 years ago, literally, I think it was about three weeks before, we were very excited, everything's about to change. MC wakes up that morning and she's just feeling really ill. For those of you that don't know, she's got chronic kidney failure. She's got 20% of one kidney. That's all she's got. She's got nothing. You've got two kidneys working 100%. She's got one kidney working 20%, okay? And uh, she wakes up, and she's just really feeling ill. And then literally within hours, she goes from feeling really ill to I've got to rush her to hospital. Get her to hospital, and the doctors are trying to find out what's going on. They're doing all sorts of tests, and at one point they say, well, we've got a major problem because she has now got an obstruction from that one little kidney. The, the tube that runs out that should run into your bladder, she doesn't have a bladder either, but that tube was blocked. Uh, something had obstructed it. And what was happening is her 20% little kidney was now getting urine flooding back into it. Urine is acidic. It eats your kidney away. So literally, the urine is eating the last little bit of her kidney away, and we have to operate to save her life. Okay, this wasn't what I expecting at this point in our lives. Uh, it went from bad to worse. Often it does when things go wrong medically. And uh, the next thing I know, within the uh, uh, next morning I arrive at hospital and she can't breathe. She's literally suffocating on a hospital bed. I'm sitting there thinking, what is going on? What's happened is her, blood, her body is so filled with urine now because she can't get rid of it that the urine is now flooding into her lungs. And her lungs are collapsing, filled with urine. She's in agony, fever now because her body's reacting to the urine that's now flooding everywhere. And I'll never forget the doctors coming in. I was in the room. They literally ran in. It was like we had a nurse who was part of our church in the room saying, MC is dying. They're putting out prayer things, and I'm just thinking, what is going on? Doctors run, and they didn't even have a chance to inject her. They literally ram a steel pipe about this thick through each of her sides, through her ribs, into her lungs, to puncture her lungs so that they can flood the urine out of her lungs. And she's just going from bad to where she, she was out at one point, passed out, struggling to breathe, infections in her whole body, and the doctors are fighting to save her life. I remember standing next to her bed, the one as she was, and, and she's dying. She's literally dying. And I'm just thinking, God, you promised us a church plant. You promised us all these things. How can you, right now, as we're about to walk in the things you promised us, how can you take my wife? And I had this anger start to rise up in me. I don't generally get violent, but I remember at one point, Feeling like, gee, I remember thinking this. If you appear in the room to me, Jesus, I'm going to punch you in the face. I remember thinking that. I was that angry with God. Like, you see, it wasn't just my wife that was dying. It was every single promise he had made that was dying with her. Because how would we ever walk forward? 
I remember driving home that night. It was winter, and it was one of your kind of summery days. It was terrible. <laughs> and I remember driving home and just weeping, just like, because every single thing that God had promised us, every dream that I'd had for so long, all the life that I'd given was just getting lost in this moment. It was like everything that I felt God had called us to was going to die. Drove home that night, and I was sitting next to the fire, alone at home, just sobbing, because it was just helpless. Like, I can't do anything about this, God, and you don't seem to be helping a whole lot. And sitting at the fire, I heard the Lord speak to me. He said this to me, Andrew, you still don't have the faith of your father, Abraham. And at that moment, I realized what he was saying. He wasn't saying that I didn't have faith for him, her to get healed. You see, Abraham had a promise from God. That God would give him a son, a miraculous son. And through that son, all nations of the world would be blessed. And then God took that son. Made Abraham go up a mountain with a knife and say, you know the promise? You know the things I promised you? I want you to kill it. And Abraham believed God. Didn't know how it would work. But he knew that God was a God who was faithful to his word. And he was prepared to put a knife into the promise that God had made to him. Knowing that even though I don't understand, God, I know you're good. And I knew God was saying to me in that moment, Andrew, Andrew, will you love me and serve me and believe in me? Even if I take every single thing that you love away, including the promises I've made. And at that point, I remember going, okay, you can take MC. You can have her. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how I'm going to move through this. But you can take my wife. You can take every promise that you've made me. And I will still believe that you are good. I arrived at the hospital the next morning to find her sitting up in bed. (laughs) Miraculously, things had turned around overnight and God gave her back to me, just like he did. But it was a a lesson for me of being trapped because I nearly got trapped. I nearly got trapped. I nearly got so offended at God that he could do this. And I didn't understand his ways. I didn't understand. I didn't read him through the big picture. I read him through the moment and I nearly got stuck. And I think so many of us, we do these things. We read God through the moment. We read God through this thing that's coming and we don't understand how it fits in to the framework of who God is and how he works. You know, John and myself aren't the only two that get trapped because actually in the the Bible, we actually see a lot of people that got trapped and some actually got lost in the moment. And one one of the sad moments for me of Jesus' ministry was when he was teaching and he's got large crowds following him. People are really enjoying what he's saying. And at one point he, he starts to say something which they don't understand. He says this, Unless you eat of my flesh... And drink of my blood. You have no part of me. Now, now that sounds a little bit offensive if you think about it. it. It sounds to the Jews that are following him that unless they eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. I mean, we're not allowed to do that in Jewish law. The Jews are told that they were forbidden to drink blood. How can we drink your blood? How can we eat of your flesh? What are you even saying? And the Bible says a lot of the disciples who had followed him actually took an offense and left him. And Jesus literally turns to the disciples and he says, um, John 6 verse 61, all right, knowing that his disciples are grumbling about this, so they're not happy. <laughs> Sometimes disciples grumble. I mean, yeah, who's ever grumbled against God? <laughs> Be honest. You're grumbling like, I don't get this, God. This is not cool. Okay. And he says to them, do you take offense at this? Guess what word he uses? Did you get trapped? Did you get scandal on? Did the, did the trap fall on you in this moment? Did you take offense at this? And at one point, you know, he says, are you going to leave? And I love their response. Oh, we're really offended at what you've just said. We don't understand it, but where do we go? You've got the words of life. We don't understand this, but we know that we've got to stick with you. Because you've got the words of life. We don't understand how that all works out, but we know who you are. 
And I think so often in life, we've got to learn from that moment and from the disciples. Many left. They didn't. They grumbled and they, in their fence, they walked away. And many people do that to Jesus. You'll find Christians that once served God passionately that are now, they've been trapped. They've taken offense. They've been hurt by the church or hurt by something that God did or didn't do in their mind. And they've got offended and they've grumbled and they've left. But those that stick it through are those that go, well, I don't get it, God. But I know your ways. I know that you've got the words of life. I don't understand how life fits in this moment, but I know you've got the words of life. So I'm sticking around with you. And as Christians, we've got to get that point where we move away from our understanding to uh, learning and, and knowing about the ways of God and holding on to those things. So here's some reasons why we get scandalized, why we get trapped. And the first one is because we actually are idolatrous. You say, what do you mean, Andrew? Well, idolatry is when you make a God off to your own image, or you make a God who's not the true God, and you worship that God. And how many of you know as Christians, we actually are quite prone to idolatry, because often we make out Jesus who we want him to be. In fact, the Bible says in the end times, a lot of Christians would do that. We'd make a God that, you know... We, we would gather teachers to tell us what we want to hear. So we make a God that will serve us. We make a God that will you know, do things the way we want him to do it. And uh, we want to understand God. We want to we have control of God. We, wanna, we want control in the situation. How many of you know humans love control? How many of you know God, you're just never going to have it? If you're, if you're a control freak, you better learn to quickly let go. Because as long as you got the wheel, Jesus doesn't have it. And so often we struggle with that as we try to do life and we try to survive and we, we learn to kind of take the wheel and kind of, I'm going to steer my way through this. But actually, God at some point is going to want the steering wheel. He's going to want the things that we love. He's going to want, and when those things happen, we get offended. We get upset. We get hurt. And one of the, probably one of the greatest scriptures that helps me understand my own brokenness actually is Genesis 3 verse 5 and it helps us understand how idolatry works. It's, it's really a Satan tempting Adam and Eve in the garden and you remember God said you know eat of the, all the trees in the garden but don't eat of that tree and, and then the devil comes and he, he says to Adam and Eve this. He says God knows you see he wants them to eat of the tree. He says God knows that when you eat of the tree that God said you shouldn't, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What he's really saying is this. You will have an understanding like God's God. You will know how things work out. You'll have control because you will have the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. See, humankind, we want to control. We want to have, and do you know what that is? part of Adamson. We don't want to trust. We want understanding. We want understanding. How does this all work and how do I fit in the picture? Instead of knowing the one who is wisdom, we want wisdom for ourselves. And um, so we end up with this idolatrous idea of how things work. And we think we know better than God. How many of you have ever thought, be honest, how many times in my life has this not this happened? I'm looking at my future and I can see two paths. And I know, man, this one just looks like, it just makes so much sense that it's going to go this way, not this way. I remember years ago, I was told by an apostolic team when I was serving in that other church before we planted, um, one of the guys pulled me aside one day and said, God, you've been faithful in this house. And the Lord, I believe the Lord's going to give you leadership of this church. It was a church of about 350 people. It was a, quite a successful church. Uh, and I knew God had called me into the apostolic. And I remember sitting there as a young man thinking, it makes so much sense that I'm going to take over this church because it'll, you know, to plant a church is going to take a really long time. But to take over a big church in a movement that's well known, the doorway into what God's called me to is going to happen quickly and easily. So obviously, yeah, I, I witnessed with what he said. And I was very excited about it. And so I carried on serving. And years, about a few years later, when it came time to hand the church over, and I was expecting, like, okay, it's me. Obviously, it's me. Everyone's coming to me. Andrew, we're praying that you know this. We're praying it's you. The problem is I go to the Lord, and the Lord says this to me. Andrew, it's not you. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean it's not me? It's obviously it's me. No, it's not you. He, says, he said this to me. If you take over this church, you'll never walk in the fullness of what I've called you to. I said, what do you mean? This is the obvious way to walk in the fullness of what you called me to. 
He said, no, if you take over this church, you'll never learn how to grow something with a different DNA from the ground up. You're going to plant. And I was like, no. No. Planting a church is terrifying. Taking it over a big happening church is happening. Is, is, is security is no. Oh, the Lord's ways weren't mine. And I remember having to learn God's ways in this matter. So we're not going to have control. And just settle that he knows and we don't. And keep in step with the Spirit. Don't presume that this is the way it's going to go. Because if you presume something, you're just going to get stuck. Just keep in step with what he does and be faithful. And if you're faithful, you'll end up walking in the purposes of God. Second reason we get stuck is we have, a, again, a wrong belief or wrong theology. And there's a lot of wrong theology around. You know that. There's a lot of wrong theology. I mean, I, you, you travel, I was just now in Indos, Indonesia, and what's sweeping across Indos now is the prosperity gospel, which is really spawned out of America. God wants to bless you. you know, and God wants you to be rich and famous and good looking and all the nice stuff. Do you know that that's a false gospel? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, nowhere does the Bible say you're going to be rich. I mean, some of us will be blessed with money, and then the Bible says, use your wealth for the kingdom, use it wisely. But most of us are just going to be poor bums for the rest of our lives. <laughs> we're not called to be rich. We're rich in things that are spiritual. We're rich in things that, are, that, that build the soul. But many of us won't be rich in this world. Yeah. And anyone who says otherwise is lying to you. Most of us won't be famous in the world's eyes. Uh, yeah, I remember as a young man, you just think, this is where I want to be doing what I'm doing. But actually, in the kingdom, it's very different. The parts that seem the most important to the least important. Yeah. And so we often get these things really mixed up and stuck, and we have wrong thinking and wrong theology. So we get upset when it doesn't work out the way we think it should. And we've got to understand, God is interested in my soul prospering. But my soul can prosper sitting in a prison. A friend of mine recently just said this. She's going through a very painful time in her life. You know, Jesus said you've got to die with him before you can live with him. Something that's not often taught today in the church. You want life? Yes, I do. Well, die with me. If you don't die, he says you're not going to live. If you don't lay down your life, pick up a cross and deny yourself, you're never going to have life in this life or the next. And so, you know, she was kind of just trying to process this living, actually, and she's, God's trying to kill her. And I remember she wrote this recently. She said, um, I learned, you know, just struggling through so much, and I learned, the Lord spoke to me out of nowhere and said this, I'm more interested in your character than I am your comfort. It's a beautiful revelation. But it's a very difficult one to process. <laughs> I'm more interested in your character than your comfort. Because we kind of all want comfort, don't we? Yeah. We want it to go easy and smooth. But it's actually often in the difficult times that we really learn about God. One of my mentors said, success is probably more dangerous than suffering because it tests you in ways that you don't realize. But suffering is beautiful, actually. It produces things in me. You know, when I was standing next to my wife and watching her die, it sucked. Everything I dreamed of and wanted was dying. But I look back, it was one of the most defining moments of my life. Because my Heavenly Father was putting something in me of a different value system. Of I, I don't understand, but I know that you're God. And because of that, it's hard to trip me up now. Because the devil can bring things across my path. And God can even bring things across my path that don't work out like I think they will. And, and I'm, I'm okay with it. Why? Because I know he's good. I know his ways are higher than mine. And so I'm comfortable when I don't understand. Okay. So uh, bad theology. And that's why it's important that we put in good theology into each one of us. Many of you come from different churches, different theologies, different ways of seeing God. It's so important that we get God right. I mean, here's another, th I'll give you an example. Here's a bad theology that's sweeping the church today. And it's very, prom very prominent. I'm uncomfortable with the style of worship in this church. I'm a little bit more conservative, and these guys are a little bit like, obviously they had too much sugar when they were kids or something, because they all want to jump around, and I'm just comfortable worshiping God like this. Okay, right there we've got a problem with God. You know why? Because since when is it about your comfort when it comes to Jesus? Since when is it about what you want? 
Jesus said, do you want to follow me? Yes, I do. Well, then leave it all and, and, and come be my disciple, which means you've got to learn my ways. Yeah. Don't impose your ways on me. Yeah. Remember that young man that said, I'll follow you, but just let me first go and do some stuff. No, 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 no. If you're going to be my disciple, do it on my terms. Yeah. We can't come to God and act God. And, and, and worshiping the way we want to do it is acting God. It's saying, I will worship you the way I'm comfortable, which means I'm the king of the universe, not you. And as Christians, we've got to wrestle with these things and go, what does God want? How does God want me to worship? It's like when you get married. I thought my wife would be like me, but they said love is blind, marriage is the eye opener, because we're just very different, aren't we? Be honest. I mean, I often joke with my wife. You know, she wants her idea of an awesome night is I arrive home with flowers and a poem that I've written. You know, take out for a romantic dinner somewhere quiet. Listen to her a lot because she likes talking. I think most ladies, 24,000 words in a day. Take interest in what she's, you know, her day and the things that actually, like things that are important, like schooling and stuff that's just not that important to me. But <laughs> and then, and then, you know, <laughs> this, is what, this, is what, this is what works for me. I get home and there's a brand new surfboard lying on the ground. <laughs> she's standing in a lingerie waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. We just end the evening right there. It's over. You know, it's just, and we're just different. And, and I've got to learn to love her, and she's got to learn to love me. And it's kind of hard, but that's what love is. It's putting somebody else's interest above your own. And to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength means, God, how do you want me to worship you? Yeah. I want to give you what you want because I love you more than I love myself. I said, we've got to wrestle with these things. Otherwise, you know what happens? People walk into a church like it's where they could actually grow to be all that God wants them to be, and they get lost. They get offended at the worship style. Scandal on. Oh, I don't think I'm going to join that church. I'm going to join a church where I can be comfortable. Well, if you're going to be comfortable, you're never going to die with Jesus. You're never going to walk in what He's called you to. You're just going to remain in a nice, comfortable, idolatrous place for the rest of your life. Am I making sense? We've got to get to that point where we, we let the Lord offend us. And bow our knee and say, God, help me to help me to be what you want me to be, to learn your ways. The third thing happens is inconvenience. And I've kind of mentioned that now. The Lord, a rich young man comes to Jesus and says, I, I, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Well, you know the commandments. He rattles some of them off. And the guy says, Well, I've done all of those things. And Jesus said, there's one thing, there's one thing that you still lack. Sell everything you've got. Give the money to the poor. Ain't nah. <laughs> Come follow me. And the young man is very wealthy, the Bible says. And when the price of what Jesus asked him for is too high, all the money I've worked for, all the money I've inherited, you want me to give that up and just trust you, just walk with you? Give the money to the poor, for goodness sake, can't I put it in the bank? Now give it to the poor. And the man takes an offense right there and leaves. Just, I'm not prepared to pay that price. And uh, the price is too high. Is there a price that's too high for you? Because if there is a price that's too high for you, let me tell you, you'll never be able to follow Jesus. Never properly. You're going to get stuck. Because the thing you love the most is the thing he's going to ask you for. Because he's jealous for you. In fact, he's pretty much asked me for everything that I've loved. Uh, you advertise me as a surfer. Let me tell you, growing up, my whole life, my identity was tied up in surfing. I thought surfing, ate surfing. When I was at school watching the blackboard, I was dreaming of surfing. While my teacher was trying to teach me maths. My, I, I, more than anything else, it's what I wanted to live for. And when I came to Jesus, I'll never forget at one point. You see, Jesus sees the idol, the things that you love more than him. And I loved surfing more than I loved him. And I remember him saying to me the one day in worship, Andrew, I want you to give up surfing. I was like, la, 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 la. No, you don't understand. My entire identity is tied into this. Everything I do, everything I live for is tied into this. And you know the problem with the Lord is he just doesn't, comp he's not going to bend. So it's kind of like stalemate. He just kind of withdraws his presence. 
And I'm like, well, church was pretty meaningless that Sunday because I didn't surrender. I didn't kneel. I didn't say, okay, Lord, you are the Lord after all. It was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to be Lord on this one. And, you know, I'll be honest. I wrestled for six months. That's how big. I was like, no, no. Every time I try and come to presence, surfing. No. Okay, no. Fine. <laughs> six months. Eventually, I started paddling out. And now, now I'm in rebellion to God. So I'm sitting at the back. And the problem in South Africa, there's big sharks. I remember one day thinking, God sent a whale for Jonah when he, when he did it. <laughs> I mean, God's got his ways. He wins in the end. You know, I'm fighting God on this one. It's like oh, I'm on the losing side here. And I remember struggling and starting to think, he's, he's going to send a shark. Eventually, I'm sitting at the back, paranoid, like I'm just looking around me, just when, where is it coming from? I got to the point that I didn't even want to sit at the back because I'm just expecting to be eaten, and I don't want to get eaten in that state. It's one thing being eaten like I'm flat out for Jesus, another one I'm going, no, I'm not going to actually serve you. I'm thinking, I don't even know what happens to me if I die. I mean, maybe the shock is the nice part of dying, and then I'm... <laughs> And I struggled with surfing, and I got to the point where I started hating it. It started becoming like, oh, I'd sit at the back, and it would, it's just not fun anymore. Finally, I remember one day just going, okay, okay, you've starved the life out of that thing for me. Give it up. I won't ever surf again. Came to church, presence of God, okay, whew, there we haven't had him in six months. Because he rewards faithfulness. For six months, my surfing identity was stripped away from me. And I'll never forget the one Sunday. I thought I'd never surf again, worshiping there the one Sunday. And the Lord said, at the end of this meeting, Andrew, go get your surfboard and go for a surf. I've dealt with the idol in your heart. It'll never be your identity again. It's died. And I enjoy my surfing today. But I'm living on the island now for 12 days. I'm not going to see. <laughs> I enjoy it as a sport. I enjoy it. Something keeps me fit. But it's not my identity anymore. See, God strips us of all the things that are precious to us. Everything. He stripped me of my love for my wife. I love her still, but he, he's, I can't love her more than him, you see. My daughter. I could tell you stories as the Lord has asked for each and every single thing I've loved. And you know the thing is, I can honestly say before you today, and you'll know all things on that last day. Right now, to the best of my knowledge, everything that he's ultimately asked for, I've given up. I've surrendered. And I've seen how I've walked into his purposes because of that. And I've watched some of my friends not surrender. Do you know what happens to them? They get in the sideline eddy of life. And they never seem to grow up in the things of God. When he calls and asks for the most important thing, even when it's really difficult, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. This is a response that we all need to come to. Your ways are higher than mine, God. The th another way we get stuck is the misconduct of a leader or believer. I'm telling a lot of stories, but I'll tell you one more quickly. How many of you know that leaders sometimes make mistakes? And sometimes even when they don't make mistakes, we can get offended at them. I'll tell you one where a leader made a mistake with me. Uh, because it was something I nearly got trapped at. I was serving a man in ministry. I'd, been, uh, I'd come out of the world, served in the life of his church, and I had really, I could tell you stories of how I'd laid down my life to serve him. I was an elder on his team. He was the leading pastor. I was or the leading elder. I was one of the guys on his team, and I was the only other full-time elder. And he was traveling a lot apostolically, translocally, and so I was pretty much holding the fort when he was gone. And it was quite a big fort to hold. And I was trying to, really, my heart was to serve this man and be faithful to this man as best as I could. And I was a good servant. I served him well by his own words later but what he what I didn't know and he told me this later is that he began to get intimidated and threatened because there just seemed to be a grace on my life that he didn't have so what he did is he started to a little bit like David and Saul he started to want to crush me and I began to feel that coming my way he would start to say things that had barbs at me and I didn't understand what I'd done wrong it, it kind of culminated in a head the one day I was at the office, I arrived at, the, at work, um, 8 o'clock in the morning, sat down at the desk, because he wanted me there during the day, and I was sitting at the desk, and he didn't arrive that morning, and I remember going to the secretary and saying, where is he? She said, I don't know where he is today, he's normally here early, but he didn't come in, and I was like, it's weird, doing my work, finding guys, kind of trying to do ministry stuff, and 
At about 10 o'clock, I had this little moment. Uh-oh. He would mentioned something about a pastor's breakfast that was happening in the city. About 50 pastors would have come together, or elders from across the city. And I mean, I, I was Mickey Mouse. I was just one young elder in one church in a city. No one would have known if I was there or not. But I remember he had said something about a breakfast that he wanted us to go to. And I, had, uh, and I looked in my diary, and I had it for next week. But the later it got, the more I started thinking, uh-oh, did I put it in my diary in the right week? He arrived at about half past 12. And I was sitting at the desk working, and I remember hearing him walk up the stairs, and he walked straight into my office. And his face was red with anger. And these were his words. He looked at me, pointed at me. He said, where were you today? I said, where was I supposed to be? He says, I told you about the pastor's breakfast. I said, I said I'm so sorry, man. I, put it, I, I, I just made a mistake. I put it down for next week. I don't know how I did it. I'm really sorry. But I mean, really, it's not like I was the best. No one would have known. And then he said these words to me. He said, you embarrassed me today. In fact, he said, I'm so mad at you. He said, you are the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. I shouldn't have made you an elder. And then he said, in fact, you're the biggest mistake I've ever made. I remember thinking, when, you're, when your pastor tells you that, it's not cool. I remember just thinking, am I the biggest mistake he's ever made? I mean, that's a big mistake. And I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? I forgot a pastor's breakfast. I didn't sleep around at the secretary or steal money or, you know, or slander him or gossip. I just... And I remember just at one point, scandal on. Who does he think he is to speak to me like that? I've done nothing but serve him. I just thought, I don't need this in my life. And I was ready to, and at one point I remember the Lord taught me years ago, if you're serving a Saul, you better be David. And I remember David had it so bad. I mean, what did he do wrong? And Saul tried to pin him to a wall. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be David and I'm going to keep serving this man as though he's a perfect leader. And I did. Years later, years later, after I'd planted Josh Jen, he called me. So I need to see you. Sat me down, began to cry. I didn't know what was coming. He said, Andrew, I need to apologize to you about something. I said, what? Because I had covered it. With, see, love covers a multitude of sins. What? He said, you know, I was threatened by you. As a young man, you just seemed to have the call of God so strong on your life. It felt like the people loved you sometimes more than they loved me. And I wanted to crush you. And he said, you know, Andrew, I realized actually that I was like King Saul to David. I wanted to kill you. But he said, you were always a David. And you always serve me. And I want to honor you today for how you served me when I didn't deserve it. I tell you what, my heart is just... Because I realized at that point, God had actually been testing me. Because God puts David under Saul to test him. And I'd been through the testings of the Lord. I hadn't understood what was going on in the moment. But I'd held the course. I hadn't got trapped. And God had faithfully rewarded me years later by vindicating me. And bringing me through. Don't get stuck if a leader does something wrong. I mean, that was wrong what he did. Sometimes we get stuck because we just misinterpret the leaders. Remember Judas? He got stuck with Jesus. Do you know when? When perfume was poured out on him worth a year's wages. Hello? A year's wages poured out in one moment. How long does perfume last? I mean, let's be honest. And we've all seen uh, the leader gets blessed. And we're like, oh. The other day I was... Um, I saw this little Merc. It's one of those cute little hatchback ones. And I said, oh, I'd love to buy you one of those. My wife was like, I'll never drive a car like it. If, you, if someone gives it to us, I won't drive a car like it. Why? Because people are just going to get offended. But what happens if someone did buy us a car like that? I mean, I don't live for blessing. But what happens if the, if the father just decides to one day bless us? I'm not tenting for a Merc or anything. Please <laughs> don't buy me a Merc now. But what happens if... What happens if God just does that? And, and, and sometimes we, we don't understand what's really going on. And people trip up and they get offended. How could he? Well, Judas tripped up of Jesus. But he didn't understand, you see, that Jesus was going to get crucified and he wouldn't be buried in the right way. And so the father was preempting because he knew the shame that his son would go through. And was causing a woman in a moment of absolute worship to come and pour perfume out 
that would have been used at his burial to honor. And Jesus, as he was sitting there, knew my Father in heaven is going to honor me because I'm going to be broken for the sin of the world. But my Father loves me. And I'm sure that secured him as he was going through the cross and feeling the Father's withdrawal, crying out, where are you, Father? Why have you forsaken me? He would remember the sacrifice that was made of a year's perfume. And he would know that his Father loved him. See, we don't know what God's doing in the heart of a leader. So don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. I need to land. Don't, how's, here's how not to get stuck, and I'm landing with this. I think there's two points. How not to get scandalized. Here's the big one. Trust God's ways above the situation you're in. In other words, remember that He is who He claims to be. And believe what he says in spite of what you, your reasoning is telling you. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. In other words, when you think this is the way to life, very often from a human perspective, the end is actually death. So if it looks like it's leading to death, just maybe God's leading you to laugh. You got it? It looks like it's going to kill you, just maybe that's where you're going to actually live. Because in your mind, the way to life is going to kill you, actually. Isaiah 55 verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In other words... When you think you're getting it all sussed out, God's working like way over your situation in ways that we don't understand. And so we can hold on to God in these moments and just go, God, I don't understand, but I know your ways. Your ways are good. Your ways are higher than mine. So while I don't understand this action or this thing that I'm facing, I know that you're good. I know that you're good. I love, uh, and I'm just going to give you a quick little example of this in, in Colossians, uh, where we went to, in the, but in Colossians 1, 2 to 15, Paul writes about how God has given us authority in the spiritual realms over principalities and powers and rulers and demons. And do you know we have authority over demons? You can drive them out of a person like Jesus did, which is amazing. And a little while later, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 10, Paul tells us about something that happened in his life. So listen to this. And this is, again, God's ways versus God's actions. So Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited, because what's happened is he's seen these amazing revelations. He's been into heaven. He's seen stuff that he says, I can't even write about it. That's how awesome it is. So to keep me from becoming conceited or proudful because of the amazing revelations or greatness of the revelations that God has given me, a thorn was given me in the flesh. And that word for given is really the root word for grace. Uh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Hang on. Did you realize that he's just called the messenger from Satan something that God has given him to harass him, to keep me from becoming proud? Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But the Lord said to me, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So let's break that down. Paul tells us we've got authority in the spiritual realms. And then God gives him what? A free demon. A messenger from Satan. That's what a demon is. To do what? To harass him. The word is buffet. Have you ever watched rugby? A guy's running for the trial line and the forwards are getting in the way and they're buffeting him. They're knocking him off of his course. So Paul's trying to serve Jesus and while he's doing it, he's got this free demon that's organizing life around him to buffet him, knock him, keep buffing him and knocking him in the face. So he says, okay, hang on, this sucks. I'm supposed to have authority and I'm sure he tried the authority. That didn't work because God's given the demon. So he goes, please, would you sort this thing out, this guy out, because this is not cool. And God says, no. No. So he asks again, because it really did suck. And God says, no, three times. And then he gets God's ways. He sells us right at the start. So to keep me. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Sometimes to keep you in the safe place, God's got to cause life to suck around you. To keep you. In other words, Paul knows that if he gets proud, the Bible says God does what to the proud? He resists the proud. God doesn't want to fight against this guy. He loves him. 
But because of all the stuff that God's put on him and the weight of the ministry and the calling, God knows his head's going to get too big. So because I love him and I don't want his head to get big because I don't ever want to fight him, I'm just going to give him a thorn in the flesh. I'm just going to stab him in the side. I'm just going to give him a free demon to keep him, to hold him. That every time his head starts getting big, that demon's going to go bang and he's going to remember that he's human. And so the, the gift is a gift to keep him. But if he holds on to, if he holds on to what's happening, he's going to lose faith in God. What happened to the promises about, I have authority over these things? What happened? To, but he holds on to, and he realizes the ways of God, so to keep me. And so then he goes on about, I'm going to boast in this, because this is my Father's gift to me, to keep me. Have you got it? Yeah. Paul understood the ways of God. Instead of reading God through his actions. And so finally, therefore rejoice in everything. Because God works in all things for the good of those who love him. Who have been called according to his purposes. God is working in your life in detail to bring you through. For some of you, he'll give you a free demon. Some of you, <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do. But he, he has his ways and means to make you talk. Get you through. <laughs> Philippians 1 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Christ returns. Amen. God is working in you, Amen. He's shaping you. And sometimes the way He does that, He'll bring you to the end of you and strip you in that moment where there's nothing to teach you to depend upon Him, not on your own strength and your own understanding. I'll finish with a story of a true story, actually, of a missionary lived uh, nearly 100 years ago, and uh, he felt the Lord tell him and his family to go and minister in the country of Mongolia. And I love this story because it's just, from a human perspective, it's just so difficult, but from a heavenly perspective, this man feels God tell him to go to Mongolia, which is not the coolest place to go to. I've got a friend who planted a church in Mongolia. He, he tells me that uh, to keep stuff from freezing, he puts it in the fridge in his house. <laughs> in his house. Okay, to keep it from freezing. Put it in the fridge. Okay, so it's not last. And this is like 100 years ago before electricity. So it's like, oh. And he goes to Mongolia faithfully obeying the Lord. Finds the faith, finds the resources, moves his family to Mongolia. He's got a young son and a wife. After being there a few years, he's witnessing in a town trying to lead people to Jesus. And he's just not getting anyone responding. No one wants to listen to him. But he keeps faithfully trying to reach people with the gospel. And then... um. A plague, a, a disease a, a kind of sweeps through the town and his son picks it up. Eight-year-old boy. And uh, they nurse their son as best they can in Mongolia a hundred years ago in a freezing winter. And eventually his son succumbs to his illness and dies. He's gutted. Hasn't seen one convert yet. Just lost his son obeying Jesus. Thinks, oh. So he goes to the local uh, cemetery and asked if they could bury his son in the cemetery. And the, the, the locals say, no, you can't because you're not of our religion. He's like, what? I'm not burying my son in the cemetery. I can't even do that. So he buys a little piece of land on the side of the mountain that he can afford up on the mountain. And he thinks one day when we build a church, that'll be where we'll bury our Christian. It'll be a Christian burial ground. And he, he takes his son in the middle of winter, digs a hole in the ice, puts his son in the ground, closes it up, and comes back down the mountain to carry on preaching. And then his wife gets the same illness. Nurses her as best he can until she dies. Carries her up the mountain on his own, buries her on the mountain, comes back down, and spends the rest of his life preaching the gospel to this town and doesn't see one single convert. Finally, he himself dies of old age. And I imagine dying, he must have thought, what was the point of that? Jesus, what on earth did you bring me here? It cost me everything I loved. It cost me my life, my daughter, my, sorry, my son, my wife. Why do you do this? It looks like he's failure, end, over. After his death, the Mongolian government began to introduce new laws and rules. And one of the rules they tried to bring in was that Christians could no longer come in and preach the gospel in Mongolia. And a Christian mission organization wanted to get back in. And it ended up being a legal fight. The only way you could get back into Mongolia as a Christian 
is if you could prove that Christians had been in Mongolia before. But there had never been a church in Mongolia that had been successful. So no one could prove anything. But as they were going through records, they found a little piece of land up on a hill, bought in the name of a Christian church. And through that they could prove that a Christian had indeed been in Mongolia before. Which meant they won the legal fight. And they could send missionaries back into Mongolia. And today, there are Christians in that country. Because one man went in obedience, didn't understand what was going on, didn't get it through God's actions, but in the ways of God. Every convert that comes out of that country is part of his inheritance. Yeah. See, we don't understand the ways of God, but his ways are higher than ours. And as we come before this king that we don't always understand, we don't always get it, but we know him who has the words of life. We can hold on. We can believe, we can trust, and we continue through whatever comes our way, knowing His ways and not getting stuck in the actions. Can I pray with you? Ah, oh, Jesus. Father, Your ways are just so much higher than ours, Lord. And so often as humans, we just arrogantly seem to think that we know better than You do. But you are God, and there is no other like you, Lord. Yeah. You know and understand and work in ways that we will not understand this side of eternity. But Moses came to know your ways. David would cry out years, ago, years later, Teach me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your ways. Father, for us as Christians, I pray you would settle us in the ways of our God. That we wouldn't get stuck in the moments and the traps and the things that sometimes trip us up and our limited understanding or our weak theology. But I pray that we would see you, the God who is higher than we are. The God who promises to work in all things for the good of those who love him and call according to his purposes. The God who is faithful to finish the work that he starts in us. Who's more interested in our character than he is in our comfort, Lord. This morning, we come before you as that God. We just want to bow our knee to you. Say, Lord, we acknowledge that we may not always understand the actions, but we want to know your ways. We want to know you, God. We want to know the hope to which you've called us. Just as we close our eyes and bow our heads, if you're a person here today that you've come to this church, maybe been invited by a friend or maybe you've just come out of interest but you've never ever bowed your knee to God you've never acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the son of God who came to live on this earth to live a perfect life and to take away the sin of the world the Bible tells us that every single one of us human beings have fallen into Adam's sin we've tried to know the ways of life. We've tried to push God off the throne and live life our way. But the point of being a human is that we would honor God as God, bow our knee to Him and acknowledge that He alone is worthy of our lives. <laughs>